this is a, a shot I did of Jeff. Uh, we were at, well, we actually went to Moab and on one side of the street, if any of you have been there, and there's Archer's National Park and then there's uh, the, the Canyon Lands, I believe is on the other side. In any case, this was at one of the arches and uh, we found a convenient tree and I asked Jeff to strike a pose and there he is. So this is one of the adventures we had. And then this is another one, I believe this one was on the other side of the street at, uh, was that Evergreen Overlook, Jeff? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't remember which one. It was, uh, could have been Evergreen. Anyway, we-, we Green River. Green River, yeah. Not I guess Evergreen. Or, yeah, Green River. Anyway, that's another one of my uh, shots with Jeff. And we're always shooting pictures of each other. Although we usually, when I try to show pictures of Jeff, I try to flatter him. Um, I can't say that he does the same for me. Well, you should be flattered that I pay attention to you. Yeah, I should be. So, Jeff, <laughs> I'm going to uh, pin you up here um, in, in a second. Uh, the, the, the rest of the uh, presentation is yours, so please um, have some fun and uh, share your screen. And let's all learn Lightroom. Uh, yeah, so hi, my name is Jeff Shiwi, and I'm a Lightroom abuser. Um, Lightroom was actually... Uh, <laughs> the brainchild of a fellow by the name of Mark Hamburg, and I can post the URL for the story about the Lightroom development story and how Lightroom actually started. The fellow that started Lightroom is a guy by the name of Mark Hamburg, and Mark was the first engineer hired by Adobe uh, to work on Lightroom after Thomas Knoll. So it was Thomas Knoll, and then they had to hire another engineer, so that was Mark Hamburg. But Mark um, basically had gotten to the point where when Adobe decided to do the creative suite, uh, Mark washed his hands and literally went like this to me. He says, I'm washing my hands of Photoshop. And that was the last one he worked on was Photoshop 7. So he uh, is an Adobe fellow. And as an Adobe fellow, he has staff and he can basically do self um, assignments and do whatever he wants. So he had this little thing called uh, Pixel Toy, which he euphemistically called uh, Shiwi Paint because he wanted to do image processing adjustments using um, snapshots and history, which is one of the uh, projects that Mark and I worked on was the history feature in uh, Photoshop. So he started this and then it turned out that um, lo and behold, um, the entire industry changed and it turned into, instead of shooting a lot of film and scanning one or two, everybody shot a lot of captures and only picked one or two to work on. And one of the problems, of course, of course is dealing with lots and lots of images, uh, Photoshop really sucks. So that was the genesis of uh, Lightroom. And, and so Mark was convinced that it had to be a uh, asset management system. And uh, so what we euphemistically called uh, Lightroom um, was camera raw with a mouth and an asshole. Uh, and I never understood why Adobe didn't pick that up in their marketing or advertising, um, but um, uh, they didn't. Uh, but it's basically camera raw is the raw processing engine and it does the ingestion, which is the import and it does the export, the print, the save to web, all the different functions of the output. And that's the asshole. So mouth ingestion, image processing asshole. Um, so what I wanted to do is to talk about uh, Lightroom and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, in a little bit. We've got, uh, I've got Lightroom on the main screen here. And I'll just uh, tell you that it is the, uh, the uh, you can't get this yet. This is the 10.0 release. This is a pre-release, but it's a final release candidate. Uh, and since Julianne Cost and Katrine Eisman uh, and Adobe has already posted stuff about it. I thought, well, heck, I can go ahead and do it. What are they going to do? Fire me? I don't work for them. 
So uh, what I wanted to do is to show you guys um, basically the before and after all the images that you see on the screen um, are images. Oh. Okay, uh, there are raw images and the one on the left is the before, meaning unprocessed at default and the one on the right uh, is the process. And what I thought I would do is go through and show you guys what this looks like. This was actually the cover uh, to the digital negative book, um, the first edition, no, the second edition, I guess. Uh, so this was the raw capture. And then once I get done uh, mucking about and screwing about with it, that's what it ended up looking like. And you can see that the before uh, and the after look considerably different, and that's on purpose. Um, this was the first cover. I remember that trip. Yeah, do you? Yeah, you had a plane all you know, hanging out the window there. Yep, that was actually fun. Uh, hanging a $40,000 camera stuck out the window of a Cessna. That was fun. In the Palouse. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, you may think, is uh, a mistake. Um, and, and you might actually be correct. Uh, I don't know why that's small. Just a second. There we go. Um, this was actually, uh, some people have seen this, this was actually Niagara Falls, and I thought I would do something sneaky and do a real long exposure so the water would blur. So I shot it at F-22 and did a bracket of a bunch of different uh, uh, timed exposures, and I don't remember what this is. I can tell from the metadata, but it's probably, I don't know, a half a second or a quarter of a second. And of course it's daylight, although there was no sun. And I looked at the back of the camera and it's like, oh, well, that didn't work until I actually got back to the room and started working on it. And uh, really, literally from the raw image, this was the raw default. Um, then this is what I was able to get just in, in, in uh, Lightroom. So you can see <laughs> there's a lot of editing headroom in raw files, which is one of the reasons that everybody really wants to be shooting raw. And even if you're shooting with the iPhone and you, you're doing anything in the least bit serious, you can use Lightroom uh, mobile and uh, capture in raw file format. So basically I'm gonna pop through these quickly. Um, some kids down, and this looks green, but that's kind of the way it looked. Uh, but once I got done, I was able to um, not only do the color and the tone, but you can see the left side uh, has uh, a bokeh installed into it to concentrate the uh, attention on the kids. Um, this is, uh, God, this, I think it's the Stewart, yeah, the Stewart uh, Monument in uh, um, Edinburgh, Scotland. And we get Martin and I, Martin Evening, Martin, Martin Evening, my uh, writing partner in, uh, in England, uh, we got up at sunrise and, and shot this and, and it was nice, uh, but it wasn't very dramatic. So with a little bit of uh, raw processing control, I was able to make it look like this. Now, again, these are not final, final process images. Um, these are just what I've been, have been able to do in RAW. Uh, I would normally, if I'm going to do a final image, process the image uh, into uh, Photoshop and then actually go ahead and, and uh, um, take it back to Lightroom for uh, other work. Uh, so what I wanted to do is a cross section of different problems. Uh, this was uh, a shot down in uh, Antarctica. Uh, and this is what happens when you shoot in the rain um, with a long telephoto, you get like really foggy uh, atmospherics. But with uh, the ability to control the contrast, you can actually punch it up uh, remarkably. 
And again, this is, now there is local adjustments, not just global. And I'll talk about the difference between the conceptual local versus global. Um, this was uh, uh, also, this was balanced rock and um, uh, way well after sunset, uh, there was just a hint of tone in the sky. Uh, but I was able to add color gradients in Lightroom to make it look like this. Uh, another shot in Scotland, you, you might think, well, the sky is just blown out. There's no texture, no detail. And if this was a, J, a JPEG, uh, you'd be correct. But there is an enor enormous amount of headroom. This is all texture and detail that was actually in the raw file that I was able to bring up. And this is with a little Canon point and shoot. Uh, I don't remember what number it was, but uh, it shot raw. So I was able to get um, a lot of tone and texture. Uh, icebergs. Um, now, Kevin has gone to Antarctica a lot more than I have, um, but we've gone all the times I've gone to Antarctica and been with Kevin. And it's really remarkable what you find down there. One thing I wanted to point out, you notice all the black spots? Those are not flies, that's dust. And I got to tell you, the, the, the first trip, um, uh, Antarctica is the driest, you wouldn't believe it, but it's the driest, dustiest place on Earth. Um, and every time I opened uh, and changed lenses, my sensor got dust on it. And I learned how to do um, uh, applying spot um, uh, healing uh, to multiple images all at once, uh, rather than going through there and trying to do it spot by spot. So um, again, the ability to uh, maintain and control the highlights as well as bringing up the shadows. A low contrast situation again, Iceland just punching up the tone and the color. Now, there is something to be said from uh, being able to punch up uh, saturation. And uh, Kevin has tried to, uh, um, I think he's tried to uh, copyright or trademark the term raborize. Um, uh, but this is, is basically my uh, approach to punching stuff up now, a lot of this stuff is punching it up in the expectation of final print. Um, on screen, this may look a little bit overglowy, uh, but by the time it would get to print, this would uh, print quite nicely. Um, uh, this was a, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it closed down. That's a fried chicken place uh, uh, near my neighborhood, which I absolutely love. Stanley's, it's all gone. Um, again, under exposure, I will admit that I am not the perfect uh, photographer, that I don't nail the exposure absolutely every time. Um, oftentimes, I'll just bracket the shit out of stuff, uh, and, and Kevin will do the same thing. In fact, it drives me nuts because Kevin usually has his little uh, sound um, beep on. So when he does the bracket, it goes beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. You, do you mean you can turn that off? Yes. <laughs> and there's one way I can turn it off is grab the camera away from you and throw it as far as I can. Uh, you can't catch me. Now, the, the underlying image was actually pretty remarkable. I mean, it's a nice uh, capture at Monument Valley at sunset. You got the shadow of the one mitten against the other. But it's pretty bland until you get in there and do some uh, uh, localized adjustments. And I will tell you that it's not easy to do, uh, but if you're good at it, you can actually do pretty considerable retouching. Um, you notice that I actually retouched the hell out of the road. I didn't retouch everything. Some of the stuff it would have been easier to do uh, in Photoshop, but uh, some of the stuff I do it because I can, and it's also a way of, uh, understanding the limitation of the tool. Um, for example, just retouching this in Lightroom uh, is a real pain in the ass, as opposed to going up and doing it in Photoshop. 
But when I'm trying to do a raw processing example before and after, this is much more impressive than anybody can take it into Photoshop and fix it. But it takes real skill to fix it like this in Lightroom. Don't you agree, Kevin? Um, yeah, but Capture One could handle that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it can't. <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, there, it's, it's part of a workflow. Maybe you'll touch on that, Jeff, um, as you move through this. You know, exactly where, what do you do in, in Lightroom and then finish off in, in Photoshop as part of your workflow? So another example of being able to punch up the contrast. Now, one of the things, uh, being able to punch up contrast, uh, some people might claim that Thomas was wrong um, when he designed the actual tool set. Um, he thought of increasing contrast uh, like what would happen if you were push processing film to increase the contrast. Uh, and what ends up happening is that um, uh, if you increase the contrast, you increase the saturation. And that's basically what he decided to do. And it drives some people nuts that increasing the contrast increases the saturation. And arguments have been made to Thomas that the uh, contrast should be a linear tone adjustment without any impact of color. Uh, and so far, um, nobody has won that um, uh, uh, contest. Um, and as Kevin will tell you, uh, uh, Thomas is always willing to listen to what you may have to say in terms of how to do something, uh, but he's going to do what he thinks is best, regardless of what anybody else thinks. Right? Right, Kevin? Yeah, he'll do it. But he, he does listen. And, you know, he's he'll always listen. been, and he's, uh, let's point out too, that he's always been an advocate uh, for the photographer. Um, yes. There's a lot of history that Jeff and I know about in regards to when Lightroom went to subscription and all the other different things. And, um, uh, you know, Thomas really raised a stink there. So he's on our side. Well, the reason that there is a photographer's uh, um, bundle of Lightroom and Photoshop is that Thomas got pissed off that they uh, were charging so much for a Photoshop license and then a separate thing for Lightroom. So that's why it was $9.95 uh, because Adobe does want to make Thomas happy. Oh, there's Kevin. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't have done that to you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only one I put in of you. Well, no, I've got another shot of you, but I'm going to go through here again. Uh, again, a lot of it is underexposure, um, and you can bring an enormous amount of stuff up. Um, when you do that, you also run the risk of increasing the noise. But I can teach you how to get rid of the noise reduction pretty easily. This was on our first trip to Antarctica. And all I remember is Seth Resnick, we were on the upper deck of the ship and, and he's running from the bow to the stern to the starboard deck to the uh, uh, port deck. And, and he just, he was like a, a kid in the candy store. Uh, and there was one guy that walked up to Michael Reichman and this is like midnight, um, 11.30 PM. And it's still kind of like, looks like sunset. Uh, and this guy said, can, can we be done? Have we shot enough? Can, can, can I go to bed? And Michael said, no, keep shooting. And the guy kept shooting. Because you're down there, you know, why sleep? I think Michael used to coin the phrase, you can sleep when you're dead. Yeah. Well, and then Seth also coined the phrase, major gigage. Um, So a lot of this, I, I, you know, when you're first looking at the images after uh, importing them, a lot of these may look kind of like sad, you know, this is not the way I wanted it to look. Uh, but when I'm actually shooting, I'm looking through the viewfinder uh, or even the, the LCD, I'll admit that occasionally I'll chimp. Um, but um, a lot of times I'll be able to see uh, in the image itself, what it can look like, because I know what punching the contrast, punching the vibrance, um, you know, moderating the highlights and the shadows uh, and adjusting the saturation can do. 
so a lot of times, you know, I shoot the stuff, uh, not that the light is perfect, uh, but I'm there. <laughs> you know, this is Mesa Verde. Uh, yeah, and I'm, fine, that's one o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on a motorcycle. I'm going from point A to point B, stopping at Mesa Verde at one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I, I suppose I could have stayed until sunset and got kind of a dramatic sunset shot, but then I would have been an hour and a half away from where I was going to stay for the night. Uh, so, you know, I just make a, try to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And the funny thing is, you know, there is actually MIT has a silk purse that was made out of a sow's ear. Did you know that, Kevin? No, I, I didn't know that, but I've heard the phrase many times. So some chemist decided to prove that you could make a silk purse out of a sow's ear and bought a thousand sow's ears from uh, the stockyards here in Chicago and processed them and literally turned them into filaments <coughs> that he then spun into silk and then made silk purses. Uh, and uh, he did it as a promotion for his chemical company. Uh, now, that's not to say that it uh, was pretty uh, or economical way of creating silk, but you could make a silk purse out of a sow's ear if you had enough time, money, and, and perseverance. Um, again, a lot of times when, when I shot this, I was actually thinking, you know, it would really look nice flop. And so then when I actually got back, uh, you know, I flopped it in, in Lightroom so that I could actually have the um, uh, framing and stuff that I wanted. Um, Kevin was with me on this one. This was Death Valley. You can't get to this anymore. They've got it all uh, uh, blocked off. I don't think this is Kevin. If you look right here, you. One of the problems of going on a workshop with photographers um, is this tendency, oops, um, this tendency of photographers getting in your shot. So this is a situation where I would probably go in and retouch that out uh, in, uh, uh, in Photoshop. God, there was, a lot, there was a lot of rust at that place. I love that place. I know. And this was an example, I actually shot this um, this is turret arch in Moab. I shot this as an HDR and I tried to do an HDR merge and between the sun uh, moving and the clouds moving, I never could get a decent looking merge. So this was done actually before um, it, the major process reversion, revision um, where they actually uh, turned in highlights and shadows into like major um, uh, tone controls. <clears throat> and so with localized adjustments from a single exposure, I could get this. Kevin was with me on this one. I've actually got a funny picture of Kevin out sitting in the middle of the racetrack. <laughs> We got to have a picture show of just pictures of each other. Yeah, we should. Yeah. San Miguel? Yes. Yeah. San Miguel Allende. Uh, and then just even something simple as grabbing a, uh, a shot on the motorcycle. Um, a buddy of mine was up above. This was somewhere, oh, I don't know, Wyoming or something, uh, and being able to reframe and adjust the image. I find that it's very difficult to have a, a horizontal uh, horizon, a level horizon when you're shooting from a motorcycle at 80 miles an hour. Uh, back to uh, uh, arches. Um, being able to compress the highlights and open up the shadows. Uh, now, some might look at this and say, well, that looks a little bit overdone, overcooked. And, I might agree with you, but based upon my experience, this would print pretty darn good. Of course, if I was going to print it, I would actually soft proof it. 
I like my buffaloes from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to move through these even quicker. Um, Kevin, do you have any thoughts or questions about uh, when I should jump out and actually start doing the major adjustments? I'm about two thirds of the way through, I think. Well, if you're too, go keep going. We're, we're going to 6.30, okay. 90 minutes we had. So okay. um, you should have plenty of time still. Okay. I saw somebody why soft proof. Uh, because I'm cheap and I don't like to waste paper. Uh, if uh, I soft proof, I can predict what it's going to look like when ink hits the paper. Oh, look at this handsome man. He, <laughs> he, he's like some kind of writer or artist or, or um, uh, um, delinquent. Poet. Poet, OK. <laughs> so I, I have uh, the, the benefit of having photographed a whole bunch of uh, photographers. Uh, and uh, Kevin is one of the people. And, and uh, I, actually, I got about a half a dozen friends, photographer friends, that use their, uh, my portrait of them on their Facebook uh, portraits. Jeff, Jeff sent us a bill. <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, shooting digital is the fact that uh, uh, now an argument could be made for a uh, monochromatic camera sensor that does not use demosaicing. Uh, on the other hand, that's an awful lot of money to spend for a single panchromatic response. So what I prefer to do is to shoot everything in color and convert to black and white after the fact. And one of the things that Mark Hamburg did that really impressed Thomas Dole, <clears throat> Mark Hamburg, when he started working on the uh, Lightroom uh, code, had access to all, I mean, it's internal to Adobe, he had all the code from Camera Raw. So he was taking Camera Raw code and modifying and manipulating um, because I, I basically told um, Mark, I said, you know, you've got this color information, you can break it down into HSL, you've got the lightness for the brightness of the luminosity, and you've got uh, hue and saturation, you should be able to have really elaborate controls for doing black and white conversion. So he, uh, Hamburg, uh, did the black and white uh, conversion sliders that allow you to basically adjust the uh, uh, black and white panchromatic response from the black and white conversion. Uh, because I asked Thomas, I said, well, you know, it would be great if you could do a black and white conversion other than just desaturating everything. And he said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, to make a better looking black and white. He said, well, I don't do black and white. Literally, that's what he said. Thomas doesn't really care about black and white. But Mark did, and uh, you know that was one of the things that Mark did that uh, really impressed Thomas. This was uh, a cross curve kind of situation. Um, a lot of people don't know you can go into the RGB curves of Lightroom and do cross curve uh, processing. Jeff, don't isn't the new version you have now um, have the 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 color grading as, uh, feature in it? Yeah, the, I, I'll show the color grading. All right, so, sort of the same process. Um, yes and no, but yeah. Um, so I'm about ready at the. Oh, here's one of my other photographer friends, a fellow by name of Jay Mazel. You may have heard of him. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite flattered with the fact that uh, Jay liked this shot enough to actually use it uh, for a lot of his uh, uh, promotions. That's so Jay has been photographed by a number of good photographers, so um, I'm not the only one that has good photographs of him. Iceland? Yep, Iceland. We were there. It, it's funny because a lot of times when I'm shooting, I'm thinking, you know, this would be a real nice black and white shot. Uh, and most of the time I'm actually correct. This is funny because the black and white ended up looking an awful lot like the color shot, uh, just without the green.
sand dunes. This was the, the trip into the sand dunes in Death Valley that Kevin thought they were going to have to carry me out. Yeah. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> walking up sand dunes and walking down sand dunes, I'm just huffing and puffing and I'm carrying around this big fucking phase one camera and tripod and it's just like um, I see everybody go way, way off in the distance and it's like, fuck that shit. Yeah, we basically got on the walkie-talkies and said, Jeff's on the dune by the parking lot. <laughs> if you need any you know, questions or have anything for him, you'll find him over on that dune. <laughs> well, I, I went out there and got some oh, shots. Yeah. Well, but, that was pretty funny, though. That was yeah. a tough dune. You picked the hardest dune to climb up, too. Well, you know, but... Okay, so I think that that's it. Um, now, what I thought I would do is to uh, take some of these individual images uh, and show the before and after and how I actually process them. Uh, and I thought the interesting one would be this one to start with. Uh, would that be all right, Kevin? Uh, you, it's your show, Jeff, so please go I right know. ahead. Okay. So one of the things that I thought I would show uh, is here's what it looks like at default. And this is the process version three. Um, I'm going to show. Beautiful histogram, by the way. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, everything is there that you could possibly want. Yeah, a little bit of the exposed to the right uh, overdose. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, people really misunderstood exposed to the right. And, and Michael, when he wrote it, he was translating what Thomas Noel told him. He got one little bit part, one little part, a little bit wrong, but the underlying premise is correct. Uh, but when you expose to the right, you don't overexpose uh, artificially. You expose as much to the right as you can without getting clipping. Now, according to this, this is clipping. If I update to the most recent version, um, there is still clipping. But if I click on auto, and I'll, I'm going to tell everybody a little secret. Um, the auto button is a little something that I had a little something something to do with. Adobe actually paid me <laughs> initially to, to submit a thousand of my images uh, in before and after. So they had the raw image at default, and then they had the processed image that I had adjusted <clears throat> to help them teach their AI how to adjust raw images. And um, what ended up happening was that it actually worked pretty good. Um, but what ended up happening was that um, my images tended to not be screwed up nearly enough. Uh, so they actually solicited a bunch of other images from other people, including Adobe engineers and, and marketing people. So I ended up adjusting another 4,000 images. I got pretty damn quick adjusting images. Uh, so for a total of about 5,000 images, and that's what they used to train the AI. But what you can see is that you can actually pull it so that there's actually no clipping. You can see there's no clipping. There's clumping, and there's a difference between clumping and clipping. Clumping is where you have an enormous amount of data all in a clump that you then have to redistribute. Uh, and admittedly, my auto didn't fix this as well as I could fix it. But you can see what I'm doing here is pulling the, um, and in fact, I can actually do it right on the histogram. I'm redistributing the tonality, uh, and now actually I've gotten stuff too dark, so now I got to go back in and lighten it. You might think, well, geez, you're actually increasing the contrast? Yes. So basically, by the time that I ended up adjusting it, uh, and actually, you see the clipping here? <laughs> Ironically, I actually added um, a, a local adjustment 
to actually cause the clipping because it wanted to be white right there. That makes sense? Yeah, you know, you could actually crop that. It would look really nice without that highlight there. I know you like that format, but man, that's a nice image and very abstract but the other way. Yeah. Um, so let me show you, uh, I'm tempted to do this one of Kevin, but I'm, I'm going to resist that. Try to, um, please. <laughs> um, let me do the, uh, okay, so uh, let me just reset. And okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is crop. Um, one thing that you do want to do uh, is the, the crop, the auto button is impacted by the crop because the auto evaluates the image based upon what's visible inside the crop window. Uh, so you can actually end up with two different adjustments. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and click on auto. You can see that that's not nearly enough. I'm going to warm it up. Now, one of the things that <coughs> conceptually, a lot of photographers, uh, a lot of people I see have a hard time um, knowing when to quit trying to adjust something globally and then just adjust it locally. And this is a prime example being able to take the gradient adjustment and coming in here and I'm going to uh, hold down the exposure, increase the contrast, darken the blacks, increase the clarity. And you can see that I'm making the image much more dramatic I'm also going to cool down the color up above. Now, there's some things that you've got to be careful of. One of the things that I like being able to do is to come back in here and I'm going to show selected mask overlay. So wherever it's green, uh, the image is going to be applied and wherever it's clear, it's not going to be applied. <clears throat> and I'm going to use the auto mask. And you see I'm holding down the option or alt key to do a delete brush. Uh, and I'm just going to drag along in here to delete the portion that is, oops, let me raise the flow. Because I didn't want to adjust the um, actual stone. I didn't want to darken the stone. Everybody sees what I'm doing here. I'm adding it globe. I'm adding it overall in the gradient, and then subtracting the portions that I don't want. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that's. This is before the local adjustment, <clears throat> then this is after the local adjustment. Now, obviously I was gonna go back in and apply some additional, oops. There we go. Wanted to get back to that. So I think that that uh, actually is a good example of showing, uh, yes, I could darken everything down uh, globally, but it's much easier to do it locally. And uh, let's see, this one is an interesting one because Obviously, the image on the left and the image on the right. <clears throat> okay, I'll admit when I shot this and looked at the image on the left, it was like, well, that's pretty boring. 
And it was not really, it was not until I was able to uh, bring it up into Lightroom and manipulate it to show what it looked like. Um, so basically what you can see here is that I've punched up the vibrance a lot, saturation quite a bit, contrast quite a bit. Um, and then I don't think I actually did much in the way of local, but I was going to show uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I find particularly useful is using the auto mask, uh, but in a way that you might not think of. Uh, so basically, I'm going to do an unusual approach to this. I'm going to uh, I'm going to paint over the entire image. Okay, and just to show you, so I'm painted the entire image, correct? So this is like doing a global adjustment over everything. But then what I'm going to do is come in with the auto mask and do the um, um, the uh, option or alt key. And I'm going to make the brush bigger. And now what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to erase the areas that I don't want to adjust. So rather than doing the other way where you paint areas in to adjust, I'm actually getting rid of the areas that I don't want to adjust. What I'm actually doing is making a uh, mask by which the, I'm going to then be able to do the adjustments through. Okay, so Jeff, they're mentioning, of, Jeff, they're mentioning they can't see the brush on the, uh, the screen. Is there, um, they can see what you're doing, but it doesn't show the size of the brush or anything like that. Um, yeah, that's Zoom. It's it's just not showing that specialized uh, uh, cursor because it's a system hack. Uh, just take um, understand that at the moment the brush is about the size of the center area. Okay, uh, and I saw uh, a question about changing the uh, color of the mask. You can do that by clicking on the shift and the O key. Oh, that's good, because I want to get rid of that red right there. OK, so wherever it's red is going to be adjusted. And wherever it is uh, not red, oh, actually, it's just the other way around. OK, so basically what this allows me to do is to come back in. Let me do an adjustment that is a little bit more obvious where I'm doing um, desaturation. So do you understand what I'm doing is instead of trying to paint the adjustment in uh, by sneaking up on it, I'm doing the entire adjustment and then selectively deleting the area. Now, if you want to know what the auto mask is, um, auto mask here is Mark Hamburg's implementation of uh, background eraser. Uh, in Photoshop, there's a background eraser. And what the background eraser does is, and unfortunately, since we cannot actually see the cursor, you're going to have to just extrapolate. In the center of the brush cursor is a crosshair. The center of the cursor of the brush. So right where you see my arrow of the cursor, right there, the algorithm is sensing whatever the color, uh, the RGB or HSL, I think it's actually HSL values underneath. And what it'll do is apply 
the mask wherever it is seen uh, that HSL color underneath the actual uh, crosshairs. So that's how you actually control. Now, the thing about it is uh, what is not very obvious, let me see if I can find something uh, that might be a little bit easier to, to show. Hey, Jeff, just while you're doing that, um, can you invert a mask? Yeah, you know, I wish you could, and it drives me nuts that you can't. Um, and it, it would be so simple to just paint in something and then say invert or duplicate. Now you can duplicate a local adjustment, <coughs> a global and uh, um, uh, a radial and a um, gradient by holding down the option key and dragging it, it duplicates it. Um, but Unfortunately, on the adjustment brush, it gets very, very tricky. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick this one. Okay, so I'm going to do an adjustment here. Uh, and I've got the auto mask clicked. Okay, so say for example, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to adjust the the sky. Now, the one thing that I'll say a lot of times, uh, I actually already have the sky adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll show you what I was going to do anyway. Here, I'll delete that. Um, so I'm making the brush quite big. And I'm going to click. You can see where the um, brush is being added. So as long as the center underneath where I click is not being off. So for example, if I, if I, if I get too close to the edge and click, oops, I don't want to actually click on him. So undo. Um, and that's why a lot of times I just make the brush really big and I do single clicks on where I know I want to, to grab as opposed to trying to brush along a real straight line. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're using a big brush in a very selective way of adding. Now I'm going to hide that. And what I wanted to do is to come in here and increase the noise reduction. One of the things that you'll find is the blue channel, uh, blue sky, particularly if you do a little bit of tone and adjustment um, and, and sharpening that the, the blue will get uh, a little bit uh, 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 noisy. So then being able to come back in. Uh, and let me just point out something about the sharpening and the noise reduction. You've got more A and D fringe, uh, which actually are pretty useful. Um, although more A, not so much anymore. Most of the sensors are such high resolution that it's rare to run into more A. Um, Capture One has a real good anti moray, uh, mainly because of the fact that. <laughs> it was a sorry real to problem. Say, Kevin, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. some of their sensors have a propensity of showing moray. Yeah, the um, early ones did back in the uh, be before yeah, they went to see. Which is why they added that. Um, but so what ends up happening is that uh, when you're creating a local adjustment, whether it's um, a gradient. Uh, a radial or a painted adjustment. <clears throat> Sharpness and noise reduction use whatever is currently set in the uh, default, uh, uh, the detail panel. So here I've got sharpening, I've got noise reduction. So whatever is set in the, the detail panel, if I do a plus or minus noise um, uh, if I add noise, it's adding additional volume of the noise reduction. 
um, it's only changing the volume amount of the noise reduction so that basically I can go in there and really cut back on the noise of the um, uh, blue channel. And then sharpening, uh, if I increase the sharpening, it increases based upon the amount in the sharpening uh, um, slider. Uh, and if I go zero to minus 50, it will reduce the amount of sharpening in, uh, that is in the detail slider. But if I go 50 to minus 100, <laughs> it actually introduces blur. And it's blur like camera blur. Um, or lens blur a la Photoshop. So that's interesting. I'll cover that a little bit more in the, in the, um, uh, when I talk about the uh, um, uh, detail. So let me show you here, I'm going to show converting to color uh, from color to black and white. And one of the things that I like, um, Okay, so I'm gonna punch this up. Um, just briefly, does, I'm assuming that everybody is intimately familiar with the controls of the exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, and everybody knows exactly what those do, right? I bet not. <laughs> so let me very briefly bounce out of this and open something else. Some of you may have seen this. Okay, so if you look up at, at the top right, you see that uh, the histogram for this chart, I've got um, zero to 255 uh, or RGB um, zero to 100, um, uh, although, um, well, I'll, I'll deal with that in a moment. Uh, but what I wanted to show is what the actual uh, controls are actually controlling. Now, the exposure control literally behaves as though you're opening or closing the f-stop. It has the same effect. And you can see as I'm increasing the exposure, I'm moving everything uh, to the right. Now the contrast um, is being adjusted, but so the shadows are expanding and the highlights are compressing. Also, if I'm doing uh, contrast, if I'm increasing the contrast, um, you know, white is white, black is black, but if I'm increasing the contrast, I'm starting in the middle and um, moving the middle towards either end. And if I'm reducing the contrast, I'm taking the ends and moving it to the middle. Does that make sense to everybody? Kevin, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. It's If you look at the histogram you're showing and everything, it's, yeah. it's a little jaggedy on um, the Zoom, um, but I think people get the idea. Yeah. So then the, the two things that are, are high tech, <laughs> and are not simple explanations uh, are highlights and shadows. Um, <clears throat> the highlights and the shadows, it started out as fill light um, and highlight recovery. And the fill light they actually got from, <clears throat> what was the name of that software that Adobe bought um, that everybody was pissed off because, um, you know who I'm talking about, Kevin? I, was it one of the HDR guys? No, it was Michael Johnson. Uh, anyway, uh, they bought a, a software developers uh, and they actually bought the company just to be able to hire him. Uh, Reed <laughs> says it was Raw Shooter. Raw Shooter, that's what it was. Um, so basically the highlights shadow, the highlights in the shadow use a range dependent um, algorithmic adjustment whereby the highlights, uh, the, the textural component of the highlights is enhanced. And then the same thing in the shadows where it's bringing up 
and you can see how it's uh, not behaving like lightning or darkening. Uh, whites and blacks are just simply, and I'm holding on the option of the Alt key so you can see where the, the clipping is going on. Um, the whites and the blacks are basically uh, moving uh, everything to the right or the left. Okay, so let me bop back to this and, and show a little bit about the color to black and white and the reason that I like it uh, so much in uh, uh, camera raw. Um, basically, now there are a couple of ways of getting to black and white. Uh, if you wanted, you could come up and do saturation zero. And this is mildly interesting in that it is essentially the same as the lightness channel in uh, HSL. Um, it's not quite the same as the lightness channel in lab. Um, lab and HSL, the L channel is a little bit different. Um, although it's technically different, um, you can think of them as essentially uh, the same. It's just the lightness of the information. So if you have no color information, then it's gonna be um, um, grayscale. But the reason that I like the um, uh, uh, ability to do the black and white So one of the things that, that um, uh, you can see, it is a little bit different than the uh, luminance channel, uh, but it actually does a pretty good job. If you click on the auto button, what it'll do is go through and what Mark Hamburg came up with is a way of trying to maintain the apparent color contrast, even though when you have color turned to black and white, you may have two colors that end up being very similar, uh, this, almost the same shade of grayscale. So what he's trying to do is being able to do a uh, dynamic adjustment of the pain chromatic response, which is actually what this is. Now, we've got the thing called the targeted adjustment tool, um, which I just call the TAT, um, because tit for that, not tit for tat. I like to use tit for that. Um, tat for that, sorry, tit for that, tat for that. I'm getting confused. Basically, what that means is that you have the ability to modify the um, uh, adjustment from within the image itself. So I can click and darken the blue, and then I can come in here and lighten the red. And the thing that's interesting is you'll notice over here, let me just start. Um, at default, so you can see the thing that the targeted adjustment tool does that is pretty cool is that whatever is underneath the crosshair is what is gonna be adjusted and that is gonna be uh, um, uh, one or more um, channels of color. So here I'm darkening, you can see it's darkening aqua and blue. And here I'm gonna lighten the red and yellow. And let's darken the green. Okay, so let's come back up here. Okay, and this is one of the reasons that I really love Lightroom and Camera Raw for black and white adjustment. I know that some people love um, several third-party tools, and, and I have no problem with those, the Silverfast and, 
and all of that is actually pretty cool. But in the grand scheme of things, um, I, uh, since I understood and helped Hamburg basically come up with how this actually works, uh, I, I kind of feel um, uh, a kind of a paternal pride in this, which is one of the reasons that I tend to use uh, Lightroom instead of Capture One, because um, uh, I'm not Capture One's daddy, but I'm kind of like um, uh, Lightroom's uh, weird old uncle. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to show is the new color grading. Uh, this tool used to be uh, the split tone where you could adjust the highlights and the shadows separately um, in terms of color and saturation. Uh, now this has changed to do color grading and basically this is color grading a la, um, it's either After Effects or Premiere, uh, might be After Effects but it allows you to basically adjust the HSL of the midtones, the shadows, and the highlights. Um, so that basically I can come in here and make the shadows cooler. And I can come in and make the highlights warmer. And you see what I'm doing? So, so this component, this part of it, um, if I were just to leave it at, at this, is very much like the um, uh, um, uh, split tone um, uh, in the black and white. You can change the blending and the balance. If I do 100%. You know, it's kind of funny while you're doing this. It's, this seems to be the big rage right now on, you know, a lot of the social media areas and uh, you know everybody's trying to, to do color toning you see it a lot in uh, the movies and so forth I don't know if you're watching the new Fargo but they have their own tonality as well as a lot of other uh, TV shows sort of surreal in, in its own way but um, you know I guess it's a trend so it's it's pretty cool that you can do it and um, yeah the showing. thing I'd say though is that that one of the things that um the color grading, yes, you're you're correct. It's coming from video motion picture um, as opposed to still. Um, we think in terms of curves and HSL, and they think in terms of uh, color grading. Um, but um, what they're talking about also, what you're talking about is color lookup tables. And you can actually create color lookup tables in Photoshop um, import them in the camera raw and then use them as a, a profile in Lightroom. And uh, it, uh, yeah, um, it is uh, tricky uh, and I could actually give a demo. It takes about 20 minutes. Uh, so it's very advanced uh, and I, I would suggest it down the road. But basically this is the new color grading. Uh, let me go into a color image to show you were talking about color grading. I can see. Um, okay, so here I'm going to uh, That's not a good image for that effect. Uh, So, Jeff, that you didn't you didn't correct the perspective. Ah. No. Um, we're at six twenty, Jeff. So we have about ten more minutes, and um, just so you're we're keeping track, we can we can go obviously longer for anybody that wants to stick on. But um, just saying. Okay. Well, there is one thing that I wanted to show. Um, is the detail panel because I suspect that there are a lot of people out there that really just don't have a real good grasp on what the detail uh, panel is designed to do. 
do you think that's a, a good yeah, guess? I think I've seen this one with you before. It's a really good one to do. So, um, okay. so um, one of the things that you'll notice up here is that um, bless their little hearts, the Adobe engineers finally listened and uh, we have discovered the fact that uh, being able to use a Zoom percentage uh, makes a lot more sense. So I'm going to click to 400%. Okay, so now we're going to see this image very big. Come on, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Zoom to uh, catch up. Uh, Zoom's caught up on my side, so. There we go. Okay, so here is the raw capture with sharpening completely turned off. And that is basically the result of the demosaicing. So you're taking the red, green, green, blue pixels and converting them into RGB. And there's a softening effect that happens uh, when that is done. Um, so what ends up happening is that by default, um, Camera Raw and Lightroom will apply a default amount of sharpening. Now, the most recent Adobe standard, uh, Adobe Color, uh, uh, is the amount of sharpening is 40. <laughs> um, but there is no luminance noise reduction. Color noise reduction is at 25. You almost always want to leave the color noise reduction at 25, unless you get some really weird ass uh, sensor that's kind of whack. Um, the color noise reduction uh, is pretty much locked in. The sharpening, however, um, changes considerably. So here I'm going to click on the optimized. And you can see once it kicks in, uh, the amount of sharpening, now remember this is at 400%, so you can see the actual impact. Um, the amount of sharpening of 71, radius of uh, 0.6, the detail slider is 50, uh, and the masking 21. Um, just to tell you what the amounts are, uh, and what the different sliders mean, the amount of the sharpening is pure volume. So the, the more you turn it up, the more sharpening will happen. Uh, the sharpening is increasing the apparent sharpness of edges by lightening the light side and darkening the dark side. Okay. Can you show so, a mask? There, there's a mask, right? Well, yeah, you can actually see, I think you can see the... Yeah. Okay, so you guys are seeing the radius. Uh, okay, so you can see where the lights are getting lighter and the darks are getting darker. If I run up the radius a lot, you can see that um, it's moving three pixels on either side of that edge. But for high frequency images like this, um, one or below is probably better. Uh, also, one or above is probably better if you've got high ISO noise. So I'm going to go back down to six or seven. The detail slider, now what the detail slider is actually doing is very complicated. If you run it all the way to the right, it is 100% of the uh, um, uh, smart sharpen or deconvolution sharpening uh, in Photoshop. So if you do smart sharpen, you go to lens blur and you do sharpening, it's a deconvolution kernel sharpening. If you go all the way down to zero, it is actually considered a halo suppression. So you're creating a halo by doing the increase in the sharpening amount. But the suppression allows you to tamp down on how high or how strong the lights will get and the darks will get. <clears throat> when you're at 50, 
it's about half halo suppression, half deconvolution kernel. And I was actually intimately involved in the development of this. Um, Tamara Raw, Thomas Nohile hired Bruce Frazier to consult um, for the capture sharpening in Camera Raw uh, version four. Unfortunately, Bruce got sick <clears throat> and passed away before he was able to work with Thomas on the sharpening. So I took over Bruce's contract, um, fulfilled his contract and gave the amount to his estate. Um, so the detail slider is actually a single slider that makes up parameter adjustments of five different parameters. So I could try to explain it to you, but your fucking heads would explode. Um, basically, it is a way of doing adjustments in three dimensions between uh, five different parameters. Uh, so just understand that all the way to the right is deconvolution, all the way to the left is halo suppression. The default is 25 because Thomas was worried that the 50 was too strong. The default sharpening was originally designed to fall in to match, roughly speaking, the previous sharpening. Um, so I almost always use a default of 50 instead of 25. And then the masking, this is pretty way cool because in on the fly, it's taking about 21 steps, and I know how to do an edge mask in Photoshop, and it's taking about 21 steps and doing an on-the-fly generation to show you wherever it is white, it will sharpen. Wherever it is black, it will not sharpen. So if you want to really minimize the amount of surface sharpening, and if you think of edges as the edges and the spaces in between the edges as the surface. Uh, basically, you can mask off the surface and sharpen only the edges. And almost all images want to have some masking. The reason that masking is off by default is um, Thomas, by default, people would measure Capture One and all the other third party raw processors, they would measure the speed at default. Well, I got to tell you, um, running the masking slider is computationally intensive. So if you're going to run sharpening on 100 images and time and see what the final result will be, um, if you have uh, masking turned on, the result will be slower. So Thomas turns it off by default, and that means that everybody else should turn it on. Um, and almost anybody wants to do somewhere between 10 and 15. Um, then also noise reduction, even, the, the, even a, a low ISO, low noisy image, uh, if you make any adjustments in exposure, lightening the shadows, you're making the noise more obvious. You definitely want to have some noise reduction. So let me just show you what my um, optimized sharpening looks like. Come on. Uh, and somebody asked if there's a way of setting these as default. Yes, except for the fact that you don't want to do that because different images, uh, the actual optimal sharpening is um, content sensitive. So some images will be better um, with uh, lower radius, um, uh, lower detail and higher masking, and some images will look better with a uh, higher radius, lower, uh, uh, higher detail, and higher masking. So sharpening and noise reduction. Uh, and then the final image. Here's the thing that some people may not realize is that there is this new thing called texture. And um, I've got a URL. Uh, I was going to try to upload the, um, um, I, I basically have uh, an Adobe blog. If you do a Google search, Adobe um, Camera Raw Team uh, 
and texture, you'll find this. Um, Max Went, one of the engineers, um, basically explained exactly what um, texture is, and it's a way of doing um, uh, uh, acutance or edge enhancement based upon different frequencies in the image. And uh, it's complicated, but just understand that increasing the texture um, increases the apparent texture of whatever is underneath. It's different than sharpening. It's not the same as sharpening. Uh, also, decreasing texture uh, softens the underlying texture underneath. Uh, and so basically what the texture panel is, is something that is now, it's like the fifth beetle. Actually, it's the sixth beetle, because you could make the argument that sharpening, radius, detail, masking, and luminance uh, are all parts, it's two different sides of the same coin. The sharpening increases the apparent contrast of the edges. The noise reduction reduces the apparent um, uh, noise uh, appearance. And texture uh, basically is a tweener. And it's not to be confused with clarity. Clarity is basically a mid-tone contrast adjustment, or what's called a high loam, uh, where you basically uh, take the image and adjust the image based upon itself um, by using um, uh, a high pass filter in Photoshop. Um, sometime I could take the time to go through and show that. So, but the bottom line is that, you know, with no sharpening at all, the image would look like this. And the optimal image would end up looking like this. Now, again, this is 400%. Yep. If you look at it at 100%, you may not see the subtleties, but understand now this is, you're seeing this on a, on a HD screen. I've actually got a new NEC display. Um, it's uh, pretty cool. It's a 4K display, but I'm running it at HD because uh, Zoom would choke on literally 4K of resolution. Hey, Jeff. Um, uh don't mean to interrupt, but just a quick question. Can you save yeah. these as presets? Yes. And that's actually, if you look, user presets. Uh, I've got a lot of different sharpening. But yes, what you would want to do is uh, at one point they had sharpening presets. But yes, I, what I would suggest is um, uh, doing a, a preset for high frequency images, low frequency images, high ISO, low ISO on a per camera basis. You can set them as defaults as well. And you can set the default to be ISO and camera sensitive, uh, but that requires a, a level of uh, um, um, uh, rabbit hole drilling uh, that I'm not prepared to do at the moment. <laughs> um, so let me back out of this and show on the left is what I would consider a high frequency image, a lot of different lights and dark edges from left to right. And on the right is a low frequency image, uh, which is basically a, a person's face. But what I did want to show is just how good uh, the noise reduction can be in um, in Lightroom and Camera Raw. And again, this is going to be at 400%. This is going to be the last thing that I'm going to do right off the bat as a demo. And this is, you can see what the color noise reduction is actually doing something that's pretty important. Uh, it's getting rid of that that speckly red, green, blue speckly. So under default, you can see that the default sharpening is increasing the amount of sharpening. And unfortunately, it's increasing the sharpening of the noise as well. 
where would you normally do your um, sharpening and noise reduction towards the end of the workflow after the adjustments are made? Is that how you normally would do it? Yeah, it doesn't really matter because Lightroom and camera, there's very few things that matter the order of which you do something, one of which is um, spot healing. <laughs> That's one of the few things where uh, subsequent spot healing depend upon the previous spot healing. But noise and sharpening, it doesn't matter. In fact, I will tell you that your overall performance will improve if you turn off the detail panel itself. So if you come up here and turn off the detail panel, if you're doing things that don't need the detail, um, everything actually will be quicker. <laughs> so here's the sharpening and then here's the noise reduction. So you can see the sharpening ends up being um, in increases the apparent sharpening of the um, texture. And you can see the detail panel, um, the luminance is up to 67. The detail slider adjusts how much detail the underlying algorithm is attempting to preserve. You increase the detail, you increase the detail in the image. <coughs> Contrast. Uh, allows you to increase the apparent contrast of, or retain contrast because the luminance noise reduction tends to soften or smooth everything out. But then the final is uh, something that is not particularly obvious to a lot of people. Uh, and that is if you've got high SO that you've adjusted, um, one of the things that I recommend is going back in and adding some grain back on top. So one of the things that the noise uh, reduction algorithm does is it has this tendency of making surface areas um, rather plastic looking or without underlying texture. So here I've got texture being added as grain in the amount of 13 uh, I might actually run that up a little bit. The size is very small. And the key to this is I'm reducing the noise of the big noise, making it smaller, reducing it, and then adding grain back in with a very small size. And that's how the image ends up looking uh, a little bit more photographic in the surfaces. So that is pretty much the uh, presentation. I didn't get to nearly as much as I was going to hope to. Um, I think, should I stop uh, sharing or keep sharing and see if I have any questions that can answer? I just asked the final questions. I've been trying to feed them off to you as we've been going here. OK. Um, it, you know, we. OK. So you can see, I'm not sure if you're looking at the messages there. I think what we should do here is real quick, just do a, a, a quick closing. So if anybody wants to leave, they can feel free to go. And then we can continue on here if you don't mind. Uh, look, everybody, uh, first off, I want to say thank you for uh, coming by. It's an hour and a half. Please uh, drop me an email or Jeff or me an email or a line. Um, you can reach me through Kevin at PhotoPXL if there's any questions or you have any comments. Uh, we're trying to work with the best we can with the technologies we have today. So it was really good that you, you came by here. Don't forget, next week, same time, we do another one, but we're using your images. So if you have images you'd like to send in, um, send them to uh, me through WeTransfer, Kevin at PhotoPXL using WeTransfer, and uh, we'll give them to Jeff and he can uh, get through as many of them as he can. Um, I have to say that we both enjoy doing this. Jeff and I have a lot of fun doing a lot of things together, but. Uh, what we're doing here is important for us to get feedback on because we have some other ideas that we want to do and the only way we'll, be, we'll know whether we're heading in the right direction is to you know get feedback from all of you and uh, so forth um, you know it's time to adapt to the, the the present times and conditions and oh god jeff you know don't look at the screen <laughs> so anyway first off you know we'll just kind of close it here and then jeff can stay online uh, if you want, at this point, you can unmute yourselves and uh,
turn your video on and talk to us at, at the same time. There, there were some questions that I wanted to answer. Um, so there was one question, the person that does um, opens images from Lightroom into Photoshop and maintaining the uh, raw capture as a smart object in camera raw. Um, and he said, if he opens that up in uh, Photoshop uh, in 8-bit and then converts to 16-bit, will he lose anything on the raw capture? And the answer to that is no, you don't lose anything on the raw capture. However, if you do a lot of manipulation of your channels in layer masks and, and, and things like that, understand that layer masks um, uh, can suffer from being uh, uh, low bit depth. Uh, and so uh, if all you're doing is uh, camera raw adjustments, you could do those in 8-bit. And then the final, uh, before you actually process them out, um, take them back into 16-bit. Uh, now, what I'm saying is that that the adjustment is, is fine. If you switch it to 16-bit after the fact, it'll still be applied in 16-bit, not 8-bit. What I'm telling you is that the layer mask itself is only going to be 8-bit. Uh, uh, you don't, I mean, if you do gradation or blurs or uh, painting in 8-bit, uh, um, you may run into an error of banding in the layer mask itself, but not in the overall color uh, uh, and the bit depth of the actual RGB image is fine. It will, it, uh, camera raw will preserve everything and process it out in its 20 bit precision to whatever the final color space is. So Jeff, what about high frequency? Can you explain that? High frequency? You, you did you, try to explain it, I think, when you showed the low frequency image and the high frequency image, but. OK, um, so let me just show you here. If you look across, high frequency is how many alternating lights and darks or textures exist in a given range. So here. There's an enormous amount of lights and darks. This is a high frequency image. Does that make sense? If you think of leaves in a tree, a lot of high frequency. If you look at, uh, let's see, low frequency. If you look up at the sky here, going left to right, the number of alternating lights and darks going across the image it's very low. This is a low frequency image. So this is a situation where here, where the mitten is, is higher frequency. Here, it's lower frequency. Does that help? Yeah, I think that, that, that should work pretty good there. OK. Um, any other uh, outstanding burning desire questions? Uh, Bob has one at the very bottom on the chat screen, if you could take a look at it. In Okay. Autotone uh, did top-down processing to optimize to capture data, and then I start my processing. Can I assume that this is still the case with the current Autotone? Okay, so let me just tell you that the order in which you do things is irrelevant. Camera Raw and Lightroom have a pipeline, and the image is sometimes <laughs> In fact, you don't even want to, you don't really want to know what Thomas does to the image. <laughs> it, it spends some time in HSL, it spends some time in lab, it spends some time in RGB, it moves back and forth between these different color spaces under the hood. But the amount of actual adjustment and where the adjustment is being made is being made in the order that is optimized in the camera raw pipeline. So basically, Thomas figures out what is going to be done where. The only time that there is an order relevancy is where you um, you may have some local adjustments. Uh, and like I said, spot healing, if you put a spot down and you put another spot down, the underlying spot will be over-processed after 
uh, un, uh, before the un, the second spot will be processed after the first spot. So it is actually processed in order, but the appearance um, makes a difference what order you actually lay it down. Did you see the next one from Douglas at the bottom? Or Ian, it says- uh... The, uh, why does Photoshop display a healthy histogram, but we're returning it a Lightroom flags, highs and lows, reds for the same image. Why the difference? Well, one of the reasons is that Lightroom's uh, histogram and um, tone uh, report is more accurate than Photoshop's. The histogram in Photoshop is old tech, uh, AKA 1990. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Thomas quit working on Photoshop probably in the uh, somewhere around Photoshop 4 uh, when he started doing camera raw. Um, so that's one of the reasons that uh, Lightroom and camera raw, uh, Lightroom's uh, soft proofing is much better than Photoshop soft proofing. Um, but the bottom line is that the histograms, there is no such thing as a perfect histogram. It's only a graphic display of the level distribution in your image. And it's approximate, it's not exact. Uh, the other thing in Photoshop, uh, the other thing is that um, you have to actually click to, uh, it, it, a lot of times it's showing a proxy histogram. It's not showing the actual full um, rendered histogram. You have to be careful about that in, in uh, Photoshop. Plus the fact it depends on what the color spaces are. Um, understand that Lightroom Everything in Photoshop is processed in a linear um, gamma and in Profoto um, RGB chromaticities. <clears throat> and the display of the histogram <laughs> is actually sRGB um, and that's called Melissa RGB. There's a reason for it, but it's, it's the way in which the images information is displayed. Um, but anyway, just don't fall in love with uh, uh, histogram as being anything other than uh, mildly useful information. Most of the time, I don't really give a shit what the histogram uh, uh, is showing me. Uh, it's why I don't care about the histogram on the back of uh, uh, the cameras because the, the history, you know the histogram on the back of the cameras unless you go in there and manipulate, and it depends on the camera brand, it's all it's doing is showing the histogram of uh, sRGB. <laughs> so it's not showing you the raw histogram. So the histogram on the back of the cameras are totally fucking useless. Um, and I, like I said, I don't really think of uh, histogram and camera on Lightroom as being really um, uh, terribly important. What else? Uh, I think that's about it. You know, you just addressed the one about the camera and the LCD uh, histogram, and that was from Steve. And now he says, kind of skip the question. Now he comes oh, back. Is the um, histogram on the camera useless for ETTR? Uh, yes. <laughs> but it gets you in the in ballpark. That, in, well, one of the things is, depending upon your sensitivity, <coughs> the blinkies or, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 um, Oversaturation or the overexposure blinkies um, usually are at least one stop, if not more conservative. You can adjust that. I know that in Nikon and Canon, um, uh, you can actually end up doing, uh, um, you can set your color space to Adobe RGB instead of sRGB, and you can vary the where the overexposure warning blinking uh, occurs. Uh, I do have somebody wanted to uh, see how exposed to the right without clipping. Uh, I just happen to have an app for that. No, I've got a display for that. And I'd like to do this again next week on the ETR since we've had a lot of people leave. That was something we wanted to cover, but you go ahead and do it now and we'll start off next week with it. Okay. So if you see up above, uh, this is an actual auto bracket. Uh, from a, um, this is an actually an NDS, a 1DS Mark two or three. 
uh, the top was an auto bracket. The bottom is taking that same bracket and then adjusting each of the exposure to be normalized. So you can see that the bottom exposures are uh, roughly normalized. So let's look at the image. Uh, normally, you'd look at this image and the histogram, it uh, is showing what might be considered um, if it's clipping, it's, yeah, there's a couple of red clips right around in there. So there's a little bit of clipping, uh, but in general, it's very, uh, what I would call overexposed versus this, which was the normal exposure. Okay, you could see this is a normal distribution of the histogram. So the key is to take the, what would be considered the overexposure, intentionally overexposed by two thirds of a stop. And you can see that I'm bringing down the uh, exposure, increasing the contrast, preserving the highlights, darkening the blacks, basically redistributing here. And you say, well, why should, why should you bother to do that? Let me just show you. On these two images in the compare mode, let me zoom in. TV there. <laughs> it's my okay. dog just decided it's time to come and visit. <laughs> so okay, Kevin, ahead. and you tell me, the image on the left up here on the tire, you can see some um, pretty well, obvious noise. Yeah, it's chunky. And over here, you see smoothness. Yes, a little okay. a lot smoother. Yes. Yeah, well, that's no noise reduction and no sharpening, it's just everything is at default. It's just the very fact that the increased exposure based, basically produced uh, a better signal to noise ratio. <clears throat> and uh, the, the image on the right, the plus exposure actually ended up um, having less noise. That's less noise, but I think the way it, it has more data in that, in that, that graph at that side, I think. Correct? No. See, that's what Michael got wrong. Okay. Um, it's the same uh, amount of uh, bit depth. Um, it's actually more signal, less noise. So the image on the left is underexposed two thirds of a stop with the exposure slider adjusted up. The one on the right is the plus two thirds with the exposure adjusted down. So right off the bat, you can see that if you underexpose and fix it in processing after the fact, um, your noise uh, uh, signature is increased and your your actual your image quality is reduced. Yep. So uh, now the thing about it is what you have to be cognizant of the fact is that um, you can't just willy-nilly overexpose stuff uh, because you run the risk of clipping. Uh, and, it, and so it depends upon what the scene dynamic range is. This image was flat enough that um, I could increase the exposure two-thirds of a stop without clipping any uh, content of the image. And that's really what it is, is maximizing the image to get the best image quality. Although in this day and age, the sensors, the new Sonys and, and Fujis and Nikons and Canon sensors, <coughs> it's not nearly as important 
as the old days. No, it's uh, we're, we're we're finding we have some pretty good dynamic range and possibilities. Everything seems to be a lot nicer these days. Kind of technology has moved up, so a lot of that stuff, like Moray and things, aren't a factor anymore. Um, yeah. We need to wrap this thing up, Jeff. Um, I'm going to stop our, share. There we go. Now I can see everybody big, you and me big at least. So, um, all right. Well, once again, um, oh, we, we got somebody that joined us, Judy. Hi, Judy. So, in any case, um, we'll pick this all back up again uh, next week, uh, same time. If you have questions at that point, uh, you can address them right at the very beginning. So, we might start off with a little questions and kind of a follow up from uh, what we just did. And then we will be working with your images. And I've already received a good number of images, but uh, you know, please try to get these to me by like Sunday night at the latest. So Jeff has enough time to uh, get him in the Lightroom and take a look at what things are. Um, and we're we're prepared by the time Wednesday rolls around next week. So once again, you know, thanks everybody. A special big thanks to Jeff. Um, really appreciate it, Jeff. Um, it, it, your studio is looking better and better. Jeff and I communicate a lot and he's moved into a new home and building a, a new work area and for himself. And it's, um, it's nice to be able to see each time I tune in with Jeff, how, how much things are changing there. So it's pretty cool. So uh, looking good, Jeff. Yes. It has been recorded. Has I've already been to recorded. mention that a couple times. Um, and it'll go up on the website. Now, what we do, we send the recording to Michael, who's our video producer. He does all the videos, you've seen them. And uh, he'll put a beginning and ending on there and just you know double check everything for sound. And then uh, we'll post it up on YouTube and then I'll embed it in an article and you can go to the YouTube channel and view it, view it or view it right in the article. And uh, hope to have that in the next few days. Yep. And um, by the way, too, I, I don't think you can download YouTube on a computer, but on an iPad, iPhone, and so forth, the mobile devices you can, and then you can watch it on a mobile device. I'd have to check it on the computer. I haven't looked at that recently. I just kind of, you know, go to my YouTube channels that I like to watch, download them, and then I can watch them anytime I want, you know, wherever I am. So that's about it. We're going to sign off now. Jeff, anything to, to, to close with? Very nice job tonight. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you very much for putting up with my uh, insolence and and um, um, I, I hope I wasn't too mean to you. <laughs> yeah, you were actually very nice tonight and um, you know, unlike the debate last night, this actually worked. Nice job. <laughs> so we're all good. All right, guys, we'll, we'll see you uh, next week. Jeff, thanks very much and uh, everybody please stay safe and uh, Wear your mask, okay? <laughs> All right, take care, everybody.